Chapter Two of the Mutiny of the Elsinore. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Mutiny of the Elsinore by Jack London. Chapter Two. The Elsinore, fresh loaded with coal, lay very deep in the water when we came alongside. I knew too little about ships to be capable of admiring her lines, and, besides, I was in no mood for admiration. I was still debating with myself whether or not to chuck the whole thing and return on the tug. From all of which it must not be taken that I am a vacillating type of man. On the contrary. The trouble was that at no time, from the first thought of it, had I been keen for the voyage. Practically the reason I was taking it was because there was nothing else I was keen on. For some time now life had lost its savor. I was not jaded, nor was I exactly bored. But the zest had gone out of things. I had lost taste for my fellow men and all their foolish, little, serious endeavors. For a far longer period I had been dissatisfied with women. I had endured them, but I had been too analytic of the faults of their primitiveness, of their almost ferocious devotion to the destiny of sex, to be enchanted with them and I had come to be oppressed by what seemed to me the futility of art, a pompous ledger domain, a consummate charlatry that deceived not only its devotees, but its practitioners. In short, I was embarking on the Elsinore because it was easier to than not, yet everything else was as equally and perilously easy. That was the curse of the condition into which I had fallen. That was why, as I stepped upon the deck of the Elsinore, I was half of a mind to tell them to keep my luggage where it was, and bid Captain West and his daughter good day. I almost think what decided me was the welcoming, hospitable smile Miss West gave me as she started directly across the deck for the cabin, and the knowledge that it must be quite warm in the cabin. Mr. Pike, the mate, I had already met when I visited the ship in Erie Basin. He smiled a stiff, cracked-faced smile that I knew must be painful, but did not offer to shake hands, turning immediately to call orders to half a dozen frozen-looking youths and aged men who shambled up from somewhere in the waist of the ship. Mr. Pike had been drinking. That was patent. His face was puffed and discolored, and his large gray eyes were bitter and bloodshot. I lingered, with a sinking heart watching my belongings come aboard, and chiding my weakness of will which prevented me from uttering the few words that would put a stop to it. As for the half-dozen men who were now carrying the luggage aft into the cabin, they were unlike any concept I had ever entertained of sailors. Certainly, on the liners, I had observed nothing that resembled them. One, a most vivid-faced youth of eighteen, smiled at me from a pair of remarkable Italian eyes. But he was a dwarf. So short was he that he was all sea-boots and sou'wester, and yet he was not entirely Italian. So certain was I that I asked the mate, who answered morosely, Him, shorty, he's a dago half-breed. The other half's Jap or Malay. One old man, who I learned was a bosun, was so decrepit that I thought he had been recently injured. His face was stolid and ox-like, and as he shuffled and dragged his brogans over the deck, he paused every few steps to place both hands on his abdomen and execute a queer, pressing, lifting movement. Months were to pass in which I saw him do this thousands of times, ere i learned that there was nothing the matter with him and that his action was purely a habit his face reminded me of the man with the hoe save that it was unthinkably and abysmally stupider and his name as i was to learn of all names was sundry byers and he was boatswain of the fine american sailing ship elsinore rated one of the finest sailing ships afloat of this group of aged men and boys that moved the luggage along, I saw only one, called Henry, a youth of sixteen, who approximated in the slightest what I had conceived all sailors to be like. He had come off a training ship, the mate told me, 
and this was his first voyage to sea. His face was keen-cut, alert, as were his bodily movements, and he wore sailor-appearing clothes with sailor-seeming grace. In fact, as I was to learn, he was to be the only sailor-seeming creature fore and aft. The main crew had not yet come aboard, but was expected at any moment, the mate vouchsafed with a snarl of ominous expectancy. Those already on board were the miscellaneous ones who had shipped themselves in New York without the mediation of boarding-house masters. And what the crew itself would be like, God alone could tell, so said the mate. Shorty, the Japanese, or Malay, and Italian half-caste, the mate told me, was an able seaman, though he had come out of steam and this was his first sailing voyage. "'Ordinary seamen,' Mr. Pike snorted in reply to a question. "'We don't carry landsmen. Forget it. "'Every clodhopper and cow walloper these days is an able seaman. "'That's the way they rank and are paid. "'The merchant service is all shot to hell. "'There ain't no more sailors. "'They all died years ago before you were born, even.' "'I could smell the raw whiskey on the mate's breath.' Yet he did not stagger nor show any signs of intoxication. Not until afterwards was I to know that his willingness to talk was most unwanted and was where the liquor gave him away. It had been a grace had I died years ago, he said, rather than to a live to see sailors and ships pass away from the sea. But I understand the Elsinore is considered one of the finest, I urged. So she is, today. But what is she, a damned cargo carrier? She ain't built for sailin', and if she was, there ain't no sailors left to sail her. Lord, Lord, the old clippers. When I think of em, the gamecock, shootin' star, flyin' fish, witch of the wave, staghound, Harvey Birch, canvasback, fleet wing, sea serpent, northern light, and when I think of the fleets of the tea clippers that used to load at Hong Kong and race the eastern passages, a fine sight, a fine sight. I was interested. Here was a man, a live man. I was in no hurry to go into the cabin where I knew Wada was unpacking my things, so I paced up and down the deck with the huge Mr. Pike. Huge he was in all conscious, broad-shouldered, heavy-boned, and despite the profound stoop of his shoulders, fully six feet in height. "'You are a splendid figure of a man,' I complimented. "'I was, I was,' he muttered sadly, and I caught the whiff of whiskey strong on the air. I stole a look at his gnarled hands. Any finger would have made three of mine. His wrist would have made three of my wrist.' "'How much do you weigh?' I asked. Two hundred and ten. But in my day, at my best, I tipped the scales close to two forty. "'And the Elsinore can't sail,' I said, returning to the subject which had roused him. "'I'll take you even, anything from a pound of tobacco to a month's wages. She won't make it around in a hundred and fifty days,' he answered. "'Yet I've come around in the old flying cloud in eighty-nine days.' Eighty-nine days, sir, from Sandy Hook to Frisco. Sixty men forward that was men, and eight boys, and drive, drive, drive. Three hundred and seventy-four miles for a day's run under two gallant sails, and in the squalls eighteen knots a line, not enough to time her. Eighty-nine days, never beat, and tied once by the old Andrew Jackson nine years afterward. Them was the days. "'When did the Andrew Jackson tie her?' I asked, because of a growing suspicion that he was having me. "'In 1860,' was his prompt reply. "'And you sailed in the flying cloud nine years before that, and this is 1913? "'Why, that was sixty-two years ago,' I charged. "'And I was seven years old,' he chuckled. "'My mother was stewardess on the flying cloud. I was born at sea.' I was boy when I was twelve, on the Herald of the Morn, when she made around in ninety-nine days. Half the crew in irons, most of the time. Five men lost from aloft off the horn, the points of our sheath knives broken square off, knuckle-dusters and belaying pins flying, 
three men shot by the officers in one day the second mate killed dead and no one to know who done it and drive 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 ninety-nine days from land to land a run of seventeen thousand miles and east to west around cape stiff but that would make you sixty-nine years old i insisted which i am he retorted proudly and a better man at that than the scrubby younglings of these days a generation of em would die under the things i've been through did you ever hear of the sunny south she that was sold in havana to run slaves and changed her name to emanuela and you've sailed the middle passage i cried recollecting the old phrase i was on the manuela that day in mozambique channel when the brisk caught us with nine hundred slaves between decks only she wouldn't have caught us except for her having steam i continued to stroll up and down beside this massive relic of the past and to listen to his hints and muttered reminiscence of old man-killing and man-driving days he was too real to be true and yet as i studied his shoulder stoop and the age drag of his huge feet i was convinced that his years were as he asserted he spoke of a captain soniers he was a great captain he was saying and in the two years i sailed mate with him there was never a port i didn't jump the ship going in and stay in hiding until i sneaked aboard when she sailed again but why the men on account of the men swearing blood and vengeance and warrants against me because of my ways of teaching em to be sailors why the times i was caught and the fines the skipper paid for me and yet it was my work that made the ship make money he held up his huge paws and as i stared at the battered malformed knuckles i understood the nature of his work but all that stopped now he lamented a sailor's a gentleman these days you can't raise your voice or your hand to them at this moment he was addressed from the poop rail above by the second mate a medium-sized heavily built clean-shaven blond man the tug's in sight with the crew sir he announced the mate grunted an acknowledgment then added come on down mr mellaire and meet our passenger i could not help noting the air and carriage with which mr mellaire came down the poop ladder and took his part in the introduction he was courteous in an old-world way soft-spoken suave and unmistakably from south of mason and dixon a southerner i said georgia sir he bowed and smiled as only a southerner can bow and smile his features and expression were genial and gentle and yet his mouth was the cruelest gash i have ever seen in a man's face it was a gash there is no other way of describing that harsh thin-lipped shapeless mouth that uttered gracious things so graciously involuntarily i glanced at his hands like the mates they were thick-boned broken-knuckled and malformed back into his blue eyes i looked on the surface of them was a film of light a gloss of gentle kindness and cordiality but behind that gloss i knew resided neither sincerity nor mercy behind that gloss was something cold and terrible that lurked and waited and watched something cat-like something inimical and deadly behind that gloss of soft light and of social sparkle was the live fearful thing that had shaped that mouth into the gash it was what i sensed behind in those eyes chilled me with its repulsiveness and strangeness as i faced mr mellaire and talked with him and smiled and exchanged amenities i was aware of the feeling that comes to one in the forest or jungle when he knows unseen wild eyes of hunting animals are spying upon him frankly i was afraid of the thing ambushed behind there in the skull of mr mellaire one so as a matter of course identifies form and feature with the spirit within but i could not do this with the second mate his face and form and manner and suave ease were one thing inside which he an entirely different thing lay hid i noticed wada standing in the cabin door evidently waiting to ask for instructions i nodded and prepared to follow him inside mr pike looked at me quickly and said just a moment mr pathurst he gave some orders to the second mate who turned on his heel and started forward 
I stood and waited for Mr. Pike's communication, which he did not choose to make until he saw the second mate well out of earshot. Then he leaned closely to me and said, Don't mention that little matter of my age to anybody. Each year I sign on, I sign my age one year younger. I am fifty-four now, on the articles. And you don't look a day older, I answered lightly, though I meant it in all sincerity. And I don't feel it. I can outwork and outgame the huskiest of the younglings. And don't let my age get to anyone's ears, Mr. Pathurst. Skippers are not particular for mates getting around the seventy mark, and owners neither. I've had my hopes for this ship, and I'd a got her, I think, except for the old man deciding to go to sea again. As if he needed the money, the old skin flint. Is he well off? I inquired. Well off? If I had a tenth of his money, I could retire on a chicken ranch in California and live like a fighting cock. Yes, if I had a fiftieth of what he's got salted away. Why, he owns more stock in all the Blackwood ships, and they've always been lucky and always earned money. I'm getting old, and it's about time I got a command. But no, the old cuss has to take it into his head to go to sea again, just as the berth's ripe for me to fall into. Again I started to enter the cabin, but was stopped by the mate. Mr. Pathurst, you won't mention about my age? No, certainly not, Mr. Pike, I said. End of chapter 2